Hello and how are you toy sports lovers out there? My name is Robbie Gillette and welcome to conversation number 25 of the Keeping It Real with Robbie podcast. Where we chat all things on the mental side of sports, to stories, laughs and banter. Whether it's the old pigskin or the old leather ball, we've got you. Today I'm joined by a highly decorated pro tier in the form of Fahan Berardi. We journey through his career from his darkest point after school to being offered a contract in the toilets. It is an honest chat and Fahan shares opinions and offers points of view on the CSA situation at present. I hope you guys enjoy, and as always, let me know what you guys think. Fantastic. Another pro tier. The, na- the man nicknamed Fudgy and the fantastic finisher. He played, uh, what's it, I think it's 58 ODIs for the pro tiers and an average of just over 30. 38 T20 games for the pro tiers and an average of 32 and a strike rate of 129. Seriously impressive. I'm, I'm in the virtual presence of a highly decorated pro tier. So, Farhan, thanks so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, Look, there's lots to get Thanks, through. bud. Thanks for having me. Oh, cool. There's, there's, there's lots to get through, but I think let's start with the nickname Fudgy. Um, did it start maybe at in the corridors at Westerford or on the hallowed turf there, or was it later in life? <laughs> at the Imhoff Sports Grounds in 19, uh, when I was in school, 1997, no, 1998. I went to rugby training one day and we had an outside coach and uh, he was reading names of a roster to kind of uh, check attendance and he got to my name and he couldn't pronounce my name. He kind of struggled with the far and he didn't know if he needed to pronounce the R or say far, Han or Faran. And then he was like, well, I'm just going to call you Fudge because it's the closest word that started an F that came to mind. And all my friends started calling me Fudge or Fudgy. And then the next morning at school, like I was known as Fudgy. Fudge or Fudgy, and that's stuck ever since. <laughs> More than 20 years now. So, yeah, Jeez, that's, that's how it started. That's insane. So, obviously, we, we chatted a little bit briefly now, and you said you're watching the rugby, and you're more into your rugby, which I'm the same. I actually can't stand watching football. Um, but <laughs> you, I, I, I watched you. You did a, another interview or something, and you, you mentioned you're actually a decent rugby player. Um is that true? Yeah, is that- yeah. Like I, I just missed out on Craven Week in my final year at school in two thousand and one. I went to, I got to the final round of trials. Um, they normally play, get played at the Belleville Stadium. Mm-hmm. It's where the Stormers and Western Province train. Um, yeah, so I got to the final round of trials. I was very close. Um, my final year at school, even though I wasn't playing in the best league, um, I scored loads of tries. I think I scored forty tries in twenty games. So, I, yeah, like, so they was like, look, even though he's playing at the lower le- level, um, I think we're a couple, maybe two below. We didn't play against Paul or Bishops or any, or any of those schools, or any of the boys' schools. Because Westerford is a, is, is a co-ed school, so, yeah. I mean, we didn't, we just never had the numbers. Um, and I kicked for poles. I played fullback and, and, and wing, but I didn't, I missed the cut because I wasn't good enough for utility back. Okay. I wasn't like uh, like center and like fly off and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so I was a specialist wing who could maybe fill in at fullback, but I just missed the cut. The guy called Stephen Farmer played SA schools that year. He played the year before in 2000 and then in the same year that I was competing, he made the SA school side again. So oh, he wow. played for province, then went on to make SA school. So I was I was the third choice wing, if that makes sense. Um yeah, so I just missed the cut in, in my final year at school. So, yeah, so I was pretty, pretty there and thereabouts, really. Could have gone either way <laughs> when I left school. <laughs> a, bit, a bit off topic, I know, but just to carry on this um, tangent, um, who, who would have played or gone on to play professionally from that, that Craven Week side, if, if any? He's like, I have no idea. Okay. That's such a long time ago. I think I'm kind of giving, my, giving my, my age away a little bit. But <laughs> um, yeah, no, look, it was such a long time ago. I, I, because I don't know anybody that's still playing now. Kind of, currently, that's my age. Mm-hmm. Maybe Liam Messam is playing now in New Zealand. But like, there's nobody. Scott Bridge just retired at 38. Um, so I don't think there's anybody in our current system that's playing. Maybe Mornay Stain, you know, he's, he's 36. So, but... I can't remember yeah, who, 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 would have, who would have gone on to play. Yeah. Your time at Westerford, how do you reflect, yeah. how do you, how do you, how do you reflect on the days at Imhoff Sports Ground and, 
and yeah, just your time in general. How do you know? How do you know Westerford? What's your connection? Do you oh, just... sorry. I'm I'm based or basically I grew up in in the southern suburbs. I was at Rondebosch. Um, okay, like that. Yeah, for my sins, and I'm I, I'm in Stelis at the moment. So you're I'm, very very uh, yeah well versed in the southern suburb school lifestyle. So like it's yeah. all that Westerford, Rondebosch, Sachs, yeah. all that, all of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I loved Westerford. Westerford was brilliant. Uh, I grew up in McKay Flats and my mom gave me an opportunity to go to a good school and she really wanted good academics for me. Uh, I was very fortunate enough to, um, the year that I started in 97 uh, and uh, the previous year, 96, the, that class uh, and my class, we were just very, uh, we had a gifted group of kids. We had 180 students, six classes of 30 probably about 90 boys in our, in our year. And we, we, we just happened to be really good. And the girls as well, we had a good water polo side, um, the girls hockey side, and then the boys rugby and the boys cricket side was like pretty good. Um, the academics was great. I enjoyed Westerford, you know, it was like, I, I enjoyed the environment, you know, the facilities were awesome. Uh, and my year, it was the best academic school in the country. And I saw, saw last year, Westerford is again the best academic school in the Western Cape. So I'm really proud of that uh, five years, five years stint at Westerford. It's, uh, yeah, bring some, bring some good memories and, and it kind of shaped and molded me really. Um, learned a lot about, uh, um, what's it, morals, but, uh, you know, like how to treat people and, 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 befriend a whole diverse group of people and 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 i think that like has kept me in good stead over the last over the last little bit yeah yeah no absolutely and i, I wanted to ask you know you, you mentioned about the rugby you guys are playing maybe two levels down how was yeah. how was the standard of cricket when you were there yeah well we we cricket we played against all the sport, schools we played against sax bishops yeah, we, uh, we, we like when i was at school we played west of it as well yeah, so like, look, the standard was good. We played against Jonathan Trott, um, who obviously went on to play for England, and we played against Craig Sutton, a Bishop's boy, Western Province boy. Played against Plum State High School, and at that time, Jacob Dumini was playing, Rory Kleinfeld was playing. Um, the Weinberg boys was playing, uh, uh, I think it's John Edwards, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, we played against some, we played this, the, played against some good kids. The standard was high. Um, Sax had the Majid brother, uh, a Majid family playing in their team. So, yeah, it, it was good. Uh, we, like I said, we had a small pool of players to work from. Again, one of our most famous victories, we beat Weinberg boys at Westerford in a uh, yeah in the game. We scored 150, 160, and I got a fourth. And at back in the day when I was still bowling, so we beat Weinberg. It was like one of our most famous victories. I still have like the paper cutout. Um, from the from the Saturday from the Sunday August because uh, oh, I used to have a big spread on like school sports when I was there and so every like, every winter it was all the school sports uh, and then cricket obviously there was a big write up on all the southern all, all the schools uh, playing cricket and yeah that was our most famous victory is beating Weinberg um, Weinberg boys in a in, in a league fixture which was massive for our, for, for our COVID school oh, yeah um, did you I wanted to ask you know because I often, what I've heard, you know, you go to Western Province Trials, you do the whole, like, Sunday thing. Um, did you find it was tougher to make, like, a, a Western Province side um, in terms of your age group levels because you maybe weren't at a at a Weinberg or a Bishops or a Rondebosch? Or was it always just, did you always just stand out and always had a, had a kind of a, a direct path? No, not at all. I never made any age groups. Under 13, under 15, under 17... Oh, wow. I never made. I never played any representative cricket. I think I was really engrossed in rugby at that time in my life, and cricket was awesome in the summer. I get to play with my friends, and you know we'd have such good, great banter, and and I was good at it. But the rugby was like my main focus, like year uh, grade like nine, ten, eleven, and even grade twelve. I was close. I went to trials, but it was always like JP Dominic, Rory Kleinfeld, Vernon Philander, like those guys. It was tough to compete against them. Um, I, I competed, like I did my thing, but then that same class was like A.B. de Villiers, Francois Duplessis, Aino Kuhn, those were the guys from Northern that were fighting in the same S under 19 side. Those were the school guys played in, play, played in that year. So um, I eventually made the, the Nuffield B side. So back then in 2001, I made the B side. 
So no representative cricket my whole, my whole life, not under 9, under 11, 13, 15, 17, nothing. I made the under 19 B side, Coke Week. I went to Potch, uh, Potch or Van der Bale Park, one of the two. Vereniging, actually, sorry, Vereniging. And then, yeah, I think my year outside of school is when I kind of like lit it up a bit. I went to UCT and I played club cricket and we basically killed every comp we played in. Okay. We won the league, we won the, we won the two-day league, we won the one-day cup, played at Newland, we won Varsity Cup, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Varsity, uh, Sasu, and then we won club champs. We won four trophies at the one year, and that kind of put me on the map a little bit. So, so you go from Westerford to UCT, were you studying at UCT? I did a BA psych, but I dropped out, basically, <laughs> year one, dropped out, got it accepted again in my second year by the skin of my teeth, but I was on like probation. I had to pass six out of eight subjects that year. And okay. I really started well in the first half of the year because it's winter and then it got to the end of the year and I wasn't on a full bursary and they were like, well, you got to write your exams or you got to go to like Sasu and play cricket or play amateur cricket. And I was like, well, I want to play cricket. Mm. So I never passed the amount of the number of subjects in my, fun, in my second year, in the, in the second half of my second year. So I, I basically, I dropped out to play cricket. Okay. Which my say, mother, my mother hates, but oh, she's okay now with it. <laughs> it worked out pretty well, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, well, look, it was, it was, I mean, she hated it at the time, but my yeah, dad gave me the support and, and, and she, she wanted a good op, uh, opportunity for me to, she wanted, she wanted me to have an education. So that was a, a, a main focus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So would you say that's when it maybe clicked for you when you, when you realize like, shit, now I've, I've dropped out of varsity now. Like I'm gonna make a good go of this. Would you say is that when maybe you were like, "Cool, let's go." This is this is me. no, not 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 even close. I think I dropped out and then I was I was gonna give it. I went to the UK 2004, played a winter a summer there, which was our winter. Came back, played amateur cricket, stagnated. So I wasn't studying, but I played a bit of amateur cricket. So you get a bit, you get paid. That's when I started my career in 2004, my professional career. Played a few games, 2005 winter, played rugby because kind of called me back and I tore my ACL. So ah. I tore my ACL in the winter of 2005 in June, uh, sorry, May, and then I had my operation on the 21st of June, 2005, seven and a half months of rehab. No deal. Yeah, so then I wasn't doing anything. I dropped out and I, and I, was, in, I was in crutches for like three months and I tried to get I tried to rehab an ACL. So I was the furthest away. From anything, I had to learn how to walk again, learn how to run again. Yeah, so that was challenging. I think a click for me is when I was doing my rehab about how hard I had to work and how dedicated I had to be to uh, to get fit and strong and mentally. It was challenging through that seven seven and a half months to kind of get ready. And then I had an opportunity at the National Academy. So then when I got an opportunity at the National Academy, only because a guy called Marley Mashlombi had a stress fracture a month before the academy intake in two thousand and six. Wow. And uh, the academy coach in Cape Town was like, look, Fudgy might be the guy to replace him. Uh, Anton Ferreira was at the High Performance Academy at, at, at Turkey's. Hmm. He was like, where's that guy, Fudgy? Like he, of course, I went to the trials um, for the Coke Week about, I don't know, three, four years prior to that. And he, this guy remembered and he was director of the academy at the time. That's crazy. And that's how I got my that's how I got my shot in two thousand and six, but only to the academy. So it was like basically nearly twelve months since I had my ACL, about ten months. And then I and then I just started playing amateur cricket in two thousand and 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 and, and six, the, that uh, Feb March. I played one amateur game, fifty over game. And then I got into the national academy, and then that's when I actually. I learned the, I, this, that's when I decided, look, this is something that you, you close to, you got to train, you got to focus, you got to have a good mental side. Hmm. We played against Australia in a, in, a, in a, sorry, but I'm talking a lot here. No, no, this is, <laughs> this is what it's all about. Fires me up. No, like, look, so I got a, the Australian Academy team came in towards uh, South yep. Africa in 2006 in, in, in our winter. So uh, May, June, July, August, you go to the Academy for four months. <laughs> And then you eat, sleep, train cricket. You go to super sport to, to do interview training, um, nutritionist, psychologist, dietitian, like all sorts of like you get, phys, you, get you train at the HBC. The weather in Pretoria is brilliant all year round. So you can have nets outdoors. 
we were supposed to go overseas, but they, it, the Australian Academy came in. And part of that Australian Academy was uh, Tim Payne, Alan Finch, uh, Benny Hilfenaas played for Australia, Two Story Dory, Brett Dory played for Australia, um, Ben Edmondson played for uh, WA, Western Australia for years, and I think he played a game for Australia. They came with that team, and we played a two one-day games and a and a and a, and a four-day game. Mm. And in that, and then so our prep for that was a game against the Lions Academy, South African National Academy versus the Lions Academy. I got hundred. The very next game, which was a week later, when the Aussies came, we played a fifty-over game. I got sixty or forty balls knocked out to win the game. The next a fifty-over game, I got hundred and twelve or hundred balls to win the game. Mm. And in the first innings of the four-day game, I got eighty. So like in a space of like two weeks, I like shot the lights out. And Richard Pybus was the coach at the time at the at the Titans. He offered me he offered me a gig. He came to our function the last night of our four month stint, and he was in the crowd. He got invited as one of the just one of the cricket coaches, and he offered me a contract while I was going to the bathroom. <laughs> How how was that conversation? At least you weren't coming out with like wet hands. You like oh. <laughs> no. I just said, look, Fudgy, uh, I've seen you graft the last like couple of months because what they, what happened was you worked with our academy side for like three weeks in the middle of the four months stint, okay. and Cody Fonso was the coach of, of of the nights at that time. He did a three week stint. And he knew I was, and he culminated in my performances. And he just like, look, you want to because we left say it was a Friday night or um, Sunday night we had the function. I left the Monday morning back and he was like, look, do you want to come play for us and sign up to your deal? And I was like, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I was for, kind of told to like go and province wasn't going to offer me. Shukri Conrad was still the coach of Western province and I, that two weeks performance didn't, like I didn't do anything to offer me a contract. Okay. He still had Vernon Philander and Rory Kleinfeld and, my mentor at the time was like, please leave Western Province, go to Pretoria, play for the Titans, give yourself a shot. And then I, came, I, I went home on the Monday and then I was back up in Pretoria like three, four days later. And then I've been, wow. I've, I've been here ever since. Wow. So I'd love just to pick up on that. You know, you said um, yes. it, was a, it was more of a, you always maybe had the talent, but it was always more of a mental thing, a mental shift where you decided like, okay, let's go now because I need to focus more a bit on mentality, which I think is flipping awesome. Yeah, the, 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 the worst thing that happened to me was the ACL. Thought I ruptured a complete tear off the bone. I had to have reconstructive surgery. I took two tendons, drilled a hole through my femur, through the kneecap, into my tibia, I think, in the calf, bone, whatever. Yeah. And that seven and a half months prepared me for... I had to fight through rehab. I had to fight through a torn, basically two dummy tendons being missing. I had to fight through all of that and I had to decide what I really wanted to do with my life. And, 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 and kind of that gave me the motivation to when I got opportunities to train hard and to, and to soak in everything that I wanted to soak in. That gave me an opportunity to, to, um, to just shoot the lights out. I mean, I was so open to any suggestions about bettering myself, whether it be mental, physical, I was so in, I was in a good place to receive all of this information because of the bad place I was in. So I was in such a bad place that anything could have happened. I was, I was with open arms. I was ready to receive any information. And that was my first time at the Titans. And I learned a lot from Richard Pybus and Albie Morkel. Uh, you know, he was a big influence in my career and loved playing with him and Martin van Yarsfeld and Pierre Joubert and like all of those sorts of things. Faf to Plessy, young Faf, young I know we were like, bosom buddies like we were brothers <laughs> like in the in the first bit of our career so we were all three the same age and oh. trying to play with Africa and pull a bit of skirt and <laughs> you know try to win some games and win some trophies like you know, I mean that was that's what it was like the okay. darkest time in my life to the most yeah it was just it was so it was so awesome to be part of that environment hmm. so what what age were you offered that contract outside the toilet I was 22 years old, so I was a bit older than most people think. Like, I mean, at, at that time, I was 22, so I was being about five years out of school. I turned 23 in my first season, so it was quite a long slog. If you study for five years, you probably yeah. have master's, you know, like three-year yeah. degree, fourth-year honours, five-year master's. So I played a lot of club cricket in that time, played a bit of amateur cricket. 
but I plateaued with my talent, with my whatever skill I had, I plateaued just before I had my knee operation. So I yeah. suppose when I busted my knee, I was like, well, dude, you can either have go two ways. You can either have a desk job or you can try and pursue your dreams with the best ability, with the best mindset, and you can see where it leads you. Mm. Yeah, so that's yeah, 17 years later, that's cool. where it's led me. So, well, 15 years now since I moved up. So, yeah. That five-year period, so you go from Westerford to super structured, yeah. like every day, you know, like your class from nine or eight to three. I was a bad student. There was lots of distractions. Cape Town, when you leave school, <laughs> it was bad for me. Okay. Beach, yeah. parties, yeah. girls. Caprice on I had the long hair. I had, I had massively long hair. Because Westerford <laughs> is strict. That's short back and sides. I suppose the same with Rondebosch. You can't yeah. have a beard. But everything, you know, that you have a bit of a stubble, they send you to the principal's office with a, with a uh, disposable big blade. Yeah. So when I left school, I was like, I had long hair and I had like massive beards, I had lamb chops, I had a massive goatee. Like there were so many distractions. And I suppose um, the first two years was UCT, but play a lot of club cricket, but distracted. Okay. And then third year, I went to the, uh, what's that, two, two, three, 2004, my third year, I went to the UK, came back, mm. played a bit of amateur cricket, plateaued, 2005, in the ACL. Yeah. And in the fifth year, 2006, 2000, that's when I got my contract. So five years out of school. So that's how it went for me. I was just, I was mucking it around uh, when I left school. That was the problem. Did you did you only realize do you only realize that now or at the time did you know like I'm not doing what I have to do? Yeah, I realized when I got injured. Okay. okay I okay. was like, dude, you know we're close to getting a degree and you know we're close to playing any sort of professional cricket. Like, like a wake up call. Like, uh, yeah, like you can't you can't walk. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't walk. I was on crutches for like three months. Like I'm nowhere close. So that was the that that was the whole story at, at that point. It's quite it's a pretty low point, but it, was probably needed like you say sometimes the worst thing that happens to you kind of either gives you the wake up call or drives you to do something brilliant so i'm fortunate that it went the other way <laughs> yeah yeah was there a time in your career where you like you're maybe five years in or, or six months into after that contract where you were like damn I've, I've just gone through that five years and now i'm a professional rugby player like a pinch of or cricket player like a pinch yourself moment we like, um I'm, I'm here. I suppose so, yeah, it happened quite quickly that last three weeks of the academy went like that and I was playing cricket, I was doing well, we were having fun, we beat Australia, it was like, I never knew, I was just so, I was in a good place because I was physically doing what I loved, I was playing cricket, I was playing sport, I was healthy, like, and I got this contract, I think I was just, I was grateful from the from the word go, like it wasn't a six months later or I was just grateful from that night. Oh, okay. That yeah, night, that uh, the last night of the academy, that I, when I got offered the contract, that was like, okay, now, now it's now it kind of starts. So, wow. and what yeah, a, that's that was it. What a fifteen years it's been. I think maybe <laughs> let, let's do a game of who is and why. A quick one before we move on to the pro tiers. Um, yes. Who's the best team you've ever played against? Uh, internationally or locally, or it doesn't I matter. Just team. In general, yeah, a team where you've, where you've come up against, you've been like, damn. <laughs> uh, I mean, we I've played in the best side in South Africa, so it's not in South Africa. Um, it has to be internationally. Um, Australia is a tough team. Mm. Australia at the at the peak is really tough. Australia in Australia, that's like I've played India in India. That's fine. Played Australia in Australia. Tough. Mitchell Johnson, Mitchell Stark, Nathan called Denial, played at the Wacker. Mm. I don't Michael know Clark's played. Those guys. <laughs> yeah, so like that. I think Australia in Australia. In Australia. Okay. That's the toughest team. Sure. Okay. That's interesting. Who's the hardest trainer? Uh... A guy that I used to know, a guy called Martin van Jaasveld, trained, really, trained really unbelievably hard. He used, okay. to eat a, he used to eat a bazillion balls. Currently, at the, in the current setup, Reina van Tonde plays for the Knights. Just made a test squad before breaking his finger. He's currently gymming twice a day and eating balls twice a day. So he gyms and eats balls and then he goes to have lunch and then he 
and it's like May. It's not even like, it's like May. The season starts in like four months. Yeah. So Reina van Tonne currently is that guy now. Okay. And who's the motivation, man? Um, first guy that comes up is, uh, you well, uh, Rulo van der Merwe. I played with him. He was unbelievable. He was a bulldog. He has a tattoo of a bulldog on his ass as well. That's... <laughs> But he has a he is a, a, one of the one of the best fighters on the field and spirit wise and 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 just tough as nails type of guy um that is yeah a fighter a fighter of note uh who's the most relaxed Hashim amla nothing bothers him he's very chill his heart rate doesn't go above sixty I would imagine he's just like whatever chill is very religious guy and kind of ties into who he is as a person, which is brilliant. And it's just, he's very chilled. He's very philosophical about, uh, so he, I'll tell you a quick story. He had a gray hair in his beard and I was like, what, do you want me to pull that hair? And he goes, no, you know what? I like that little, that one gray hair in my beard because it reminds me that nothing lasts forever. Yeah. That's quite deep. He's like, yeah. everything is temporary. So everything will not last. And I was like, okay, I won't pull that gray out. Because no, <laughs> we always try to stay younger and whatever, try to beat the clock. And and he was just, he likes it because it, keep, it, it keeps him like uh, grounded. Yeah, yeah. To, totally. be, to, to not take things seriously because it's not going to last. That's crazy. Eh? Like, I, I also, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of guy that gets like caught up quite easily in the moment, you know, like, like yeah. silly example of like a test, you're know, writing a test tomorrow. It's like the only thing on your mind. Yeah. And, and really like a week later, you're like, oh, when did I write that? Was it two weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's, it's not that deep, but that I, I Yeah. I, so I, Ashim Amla is the most, the most relaxed guy. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So let's move on to the pro tours. Um, yes. So you obviously you played, uh, ODI cricket and T20 cricket for, for the pro tiers, um, but not test cricket. Uh, yes. Is that a, a thorn in your side that you, you kind of look back on and, and, and regret maybe not making a side? Uh, and on top of that, you know, you, you were seen as the, the finisher and the guy who's going to come finish mm. games in white ball cricket. Do you think that maybe, I wouldn't say it alters your chances because if you, I mean, I, I got it down here. You averaged just over 41 in 120 first class games, you know, so. No, I, I don't, I don't, re I don't regret it because my performances speak for themselves. Statistically, it's my yeah. best format. Yeah, yeah. Average over 41, played in, back in the middle order. Now, granted, I didn't average 41 from the, out, from the outset, but for the last four or five years, I've been averaging over 40, back in the middle order my whole career. Mm. Batting between four and seven my whole career. And I got six championships to boot as well. So that's the only goal I haven't accomplished in my whole cricketing career. Mm. So it's to, it's to play a test match. But at the time I was competing, it was rally the show came through, came above Vuma, got 150. And we went to Australia, played S Australia A. Rally got a double, Tema got 150, I got 110. And like... Okay. The, the two of them kind of got called up and I was, you're right, I was probably seen as a white ball guy, but if you look at my, my red ball stats, they're brilliant. So, yeah, because I was... Maybe I, I haven't maybe I haven't converted as much, but then back in the middle order, five, six, you kind of face with a second new ball, more challenging. You have to give your wicket away to kind of up the score in the race so the teams can declare and and, 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 and we can bowl teams out. You have to, you know, or... or you know, you're batting to save the game. It's like the conditions are different from top order batter where they have a maximum amount of time. Yes, they face a new ball, but they have maximum amount of time. That's all the most, like, the highest scoring guys are, you know, openers. And such yeah. and such and open for a while. And specifically in the white, in, in, the, in the short ball format, but like, you know, I, I'm not gutted I didn't play. Look, I'm fortunate enough to play 97 times for my country. So yeah. Yeah. I, I see it as I've been to World Cups and Champions Trophy. A guy like Dean Algo is a very, he's one of my best mates and like celebrated cricket there. Like he's played like 60 odd, 65, 66 test matches. Yeah. And that's brilliant. But he hasn't been to a World Cup and I've, and I've experienced that to miss out in a test match. I was really gutted at one time, but at the moment it's like, well, I see the other side to it is that I'm very fortunate to have played those amount of games for my team yeah, and yeah, yeah. For, our, for, for, for our country and, and 
I've experienced slightly different international highs and lows than the test player. So yeah. I'm very grateful for still for the opportunity. Do you do you but, think there's sorry? So no. again? No, no. Do you think there's still um a window open for you in the test side? I doubt it. Just Genuinely, based on my age. A, yeah, but I mean I, I saw your last three your last three innings is and it was you you've been getting yeah. runs, haven't you? So surely there, there's a, I averaged fifty in this last in the last four day campaign, so Got 140 against the Titans. I was 40 yeah. not out against the Cobras, like, at the last three innings. Like, so, I mean, the last three innings, I, I nearly got 200 runs at the back end. So, I think the doors closed purely based on they weren't able to justify giving a 37-year-old a, a, a spot. Um, but but I think I've let that... I think I've let that dream go, you know, playing, playing test match cricket. I think my role is going to be changed. I'm going to have to kind of... Um, mentor some of the younger batters and then still try and perform because I'm highly motivated in, in, in just playing cricket and playing games. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think I've let go, but, you know, I'm, currently I'm still available for South Africa, but I think new selectors, new thinking, breed the younger guys, all, all of that sort of mumbo-jumbo. But, yeah. yeah. I th- oh, I think that's actually a bit ridiculous. I think you know, I'd like because as you say, you've been you've over 120 games, averaged 41. Surely, especially the way the test side's going at the moment, bring a bit of experience in, guys performing, played international cricket before. We got to get this clip saying you're available for South Africa. <laughs> you off Boucher, the boys, man, come on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I've uh, you know I've I've spoken to Boucher. I've just told him I'm available for anything, shorter formats, whatever. You know, um, it's up to the selectors, I would imagine, and they would have gone with a different plan. You know, guys like Calvin Dane is playing really well, so he's you know he, he really deserves his chance. Um, but that's in a different position, I would imagine. There's yeah, a keeper yeah. bat also, which is different. Uh, but look, that's a I think I've resigned the fact that the, okay. my time will, my time has come and gone to play test cricket. So I, I I can live with that if I had the career that I had, and I, if I don't play a test match, I'll be okay with that. And um, is the dream still open for for the World Cup? Yeah, look, I think I mean I had a poor T Twenty comp playing in Durban. If you to ask me what's your least favorite ground to play T <laughs> Twenty cricket, and it's probably Durban. Yeah, you know, average season of ten games where we play home and away. We go to Durban, look, away game, cool. Do whatever I do there. But then the other games we played Newlands, which I really love, Super Football Park, which has been my home ground for so long. I'm talking playing for the Knights. Go to go to the boarding where I've performed. Play a few games at, in 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 Bloemfontein, which is a lovely batting um, ground, and I have and I have great memories there. I have great memories in Kimberley, so. If you ask me, like, go to PE, I have outstanding memories when I, and it's performances there. So, like, it's, Durban is, like, the one place that I probably yeah. didn't want to have that tournament. Yeah. Uh, they've probably resigned to the fact that, like, that was my last showing on TV and whatever, and it wasn't great. I had, like, one decent bat in, five, in four, four or five games. And so I really wanted to do something special there and just to remind them. But... Yeah, okay. I don't know. It's okay. Look, I'm still available, but... It's tough to get in now, especially if there's no other domestic games before international cricket going over. They play in Ireland, they play with Indies. Of course, uh, you know, like it's it's difficult if you there's ten like ten to fifteen games before the World Cup, and you haven't been considered once leading up to that. Like it's tough, but mm. yeah. you know that's okay. I still part of my motivation is to play well. So whatever yeah. happens, must happen like it's it'll be okay i played in four world cups and two champions trophies so i think i'm satisfied (laughs) i think i'm satisfied from that perspective you know actually insane it's actually insane i wanted to ask you about your debut uh for the process i think maybe you can do both but i mean how special um and any i mean like anecdotes around um like your selection 2012, uh, um, the, well, the ODI debut is a bit sketchy. It was against New Zealand in Kimberley, but it ran out from Martin Guttel on the boundary. But that was after my T20 debut. 2012, T20 Player of the Year. Um, wow. Semi-final against, against the Knights. We tied the game. I get 40 off about 25 balls. Super over. I get We get 19. I smoke Johan van der Vaart for a 6 and a 4. And we... 
win the Super Over, get to the final, play against the Lions, get 46 of 26 balls, not out, get to 180 in the final, win the final. And then uh, get a call to some in the team for against India, New Age Cup, to celebrate Jacques Callis' career. He's my hero, my idol. And uh, I was batting at four. Gary Kirsten selected me and he's like, look, what do you have to offer? I just blasted 360 runs in that tournament. I averaged 60. I strike in at 150. And he was batting. I was batting at four. We lost a week early. Jacques Callis and Colin Ingram were batting and they had like a 60 or 70 run partnership. So my, I was so nervous. But against India, all the big boys, Tony, Kohli, Suresh Reiner, uh, okay. Yusuf Patan, uh, Irfan Patan at the time was playing. Um, so... He was batting, did really well. He came off the field and I walked on. So he was my idol that I, that I loved. And um, yeah, he gave me some words of wisdom walking onto the field. The first time I ever walked onto the field batting for my country. And I got 22, not out of 11 balls, contributed to the, to the innings. And we won that game in a Duckworth Lewis fashion. Yeah, I still got a shirt that from that day I got it signed. It's probably the only thing I'm going to, well, probably two things I'm going to frame one day is uh, yeah, shirt and. David, maybe Avi de Villiers shirt like, that he gave to me because I think he's the best batsman in the world. So yeah, Still- it was awesome to walk. It was awesome and Jacques came off and I went onto the field. It's a guy that I've been idolizing since I was a little boy. So that yeah, was that a awesome. pretty special moment. Sure. Do you still think Avi's the best in the world? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. I'm, yeah, he's one of my good friends as well. So and, and I'm not biased. I just, I, I just think that he's the best. Say again. I chatted to Pite uh, Van Bouillon, uh, your, mm. your teammate, and he also said that like, if, if AB is available and he needs to play, I'd, I'd love just to get your, um, your view on it. Yeah, I think he should play. Uh, well, I think if he's available and he wants to do it, like, we should try and get him to play. But I don't know the real reason. I haven't spoken to him since that okay. came out. So, yeah. Yeah, but I will never know this. There might be politics, there might not. There might just be a decision he took. But my personal opinion is that if I was a selector or whatever, I would do everything in my power to try and get him to play. It's not a, because winning a, winning a trophy for the country is bigger than anybody. So if he, the report came out that he, does, he doesn't want to take the, the place of somebody else who's worked hard. Mm. That person whose place is taken, whoever it might be, it could have been me, for instance. I'm not bigger than the team. The team and winning a World Cup is bigger than any one individual. And if that person is going to be better suited to winning the World Cup for the country, for the team, for the morale of all cricket lovers in South Africa, then that that supersedes anything. That trumps anything about hurting someone's feeling because he doesn't get selected. Yeah, That's my personal thing. If I was selectors and I would try to do everything to get him to play, no matter what, he's the best option for us to win a World Cup. Yeah. I just wonder what the, the motivation is for him not to play or the, the reasoning for him not to play. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I guess that's, yeah. it's a personal thing for him, um, but it's yeah. just it's the first thing that really comes to my mind. Um, yeah. You know, Pai shared a brilliant story of Alan Donald and his kind of team talks that he, that he gives. Um, yes. Uh, hilarious um, do you have maybe any stories that you remember from any coach that that you kind of or stands out to you within a change room um, yeah I think uh, Richard Piper stands out he was my first coach he taught me taught me about the game he was a great leader of a team captain of our ship he was a great conductor I would I would imagine he was highly knowledgeable. He coached Pakistan to the World Cup semi to the World Cup final in 1999. He's extremely knowledgeable on the game, and he was very eloquent in his in his chats. And and I was at, at this point, I was very open and 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 to to accepting any information and any ways to better my career, myself mentally, physically, technically. He was just brilliant. He was very clear on his plans. His strategizing was 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 awesome. And exactly when to push and when not to push, when to when to uh, be aggressive and when not to be aggressive. Like it's it was yeah. awesome when to absorb pressure. So I think Richard Pibe is just as a whole. I know it's a long time ago since he, since he coached me, but he was just brilliant. I was lapping up everything he had to say. So um, and we were highly successful at that time. We won two trophies in my first year. It was brilliant. Mm. So I actually had it down on the content I said you is that you went to two World Cups, which you actually went to four. My apologies. Um, 
How and do I played fifty. I played fifty nine ODIs and thirty eight D twenty internationals. <laughs> I'm getting it wrong, eh? That's poor. Poor. No, that's fine. That's ninety seven <laughs> times I played for my country. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. No worries. Apologies, but I'm a I'm a bit of a stats guy, so like I'm yeah I'm I just I kind of know a few of those things. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you reflect on the tw- uh, tournaments personally? Um, and, and yeah, I guess, I guess do you have a uh, actually, I'll save this question for the end. But how do you reflect on the to- uh, tournaments personally? 2012, Pakistan was six down, chasing 10 and over. Umar Gul got 40 of 20 balls mm. and won the game. And we got knocked out of that tournament. That was the freakiest game ever. It's my first D20 World Cup. I played all the games. It was awesome experience. Um, played in Sri Lanka. But like I had one game against Pakistan. I mean, they needed 10 and over with six, six wickets down. Umar Gul got 20 runs of Albi Morkel over. It was like heartbreaking. Oh, I remember that. 2013 Champs Trophy, we played the semi-final against England um, in, uh, at the Oval. We were 44-5 in like 10 overs. We bottled it, uh, batting first. Um, 2014 T20 World Cup, we had a good shot. Virat Kohli drilled us in one of the uh, round-robin games. He got 70 of about 40 balls chasing. We had a good score. We had 175 in one of the... When we, mm. And that was in 2014 in Bangladesh. 2015 World Cup is the heartbreak for everybody. Uh, I was involved yeah. in a mix-up with JP and a catch. Oh, I remember I watched uh, that. I think JP, but JP, JP, like it was, he was, he was in the wrong. He apologized afterwards. Uh, he ran from fine leg and I was a deep backward square, and he like he clipped me before taking the catch. Like he just yeah. he dove and. I, I lost the ball for a split second because he was going to eat me. Mm. Uh, but that tournament was the best. It was so enjoyable. Um, yeah, I batted a few times. I got 10 or 5 against the West Indies at the SEG. We got 140 odd, which was awesome. I got uh, 64 of 30 balls against the UAE at the Cape Town, Wellington. And then that tour was awesome. Obviously, that was a heartbreak. 2016 T20 World Cup, we couldn't defend 220 against England. Joe Root and his team basically drilled us. Yeah, yeah. That tournament was so short. My last bowling stint in a T20 game was 2 for 15 in three overs, which was pretty good at the Ferocia Kotla Stadium against Sri Lanka. Um, yeah, just disappointing, man. I never really was fully... What's the word? I didn't play... Or, or, yeah, I didn't play every single game at every single World Cup. So it's a bit like, I don't know, not bittersweet and awesome to get there. But like for the, for the 50 over, I played half the game. So yeah. and that, the game I dropped the catch, I, didn't, I wasn't playing. I went on as a sub. Oh, wow. Um, T20 World Cup, I played two, two out of the four games. T20 World Cup against in, in India, I played what, the last game and we were already out. Yeah, okay. You know, so yeah. like it was... I was very proud to have gotten there and played in those games. It's just, it was a bit, it wasn't as easy. Mm. And obviously, heartbreak because I've been to six ICC events. We haven't won once. So, mm. yeah. Shocker. Just to pick up on the JP and, and that catch, you know, what was the, the dressing room like afterwards? Was it? No, it was dark. It was grim. Uh, it was just grim. We, it was our best opportunity. We had the best team. But they, I mean, personally, I think the balance was slightly out because. Maybe bowling in the last five overs of a 50 over game at the death was. Yeah. That means your balance is out, no matter yeah. which way you want to spin it. Yeah. Um, either all rounder, myself or Parnell had to play. Yeah. Okay. That was the trick they went with the extra batter, but that meant JP, uh, AB had to bowl. So JP played, but the spinners at Auckland wasn't going to do the trick. The boundary straights at rugby field, the boundary straight is like 60 meters. So, like, it's, it wasn't going to fly there. That's where we got lost. We got lost in the balance of the team a little bit. Uh, but yeah, the change room was dark. And Was it much dead or was it very quiet and just get on with it? Really no, it was a, a, look, it was, a, it was a little bit quiet. and, and uh, But we kind of just got through it. I mean, we, we went to India in October of that year. So for six months, we were quiet. And then we beat India in India. 3-2. Nobody's beaten it's India cool. in a 50 over in a series. 
for like three years prior to that. So we yeah. were proud, we we that was something that we really in, 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 enjoyed, and I was a big part of that series. So that was awesome. Yeah, I read an article last week. I think you know, Faf, um, or the headline. I I didn't read the article. I saw the headline, which is probably not a great thing. Yeah. But, um, Faf kind of said that he had, he had received him and his wife had received like death threats after the twenty fifteen World Cup. Did you get any of that? Um, no, no, not at all. Okay, okay, not at all. Yeah. Um, IPL. In terms of an experience, where does it rank for you? I can imagine it must be one of the most insane environments to be in. Yes and no. I think it was a bit different. So we played the 2016 T Twenty World Cup in India. Went there for three weeks. Mm. Came back for five days. Went to India for seven weeks. So ten weeks in India gets long. Yeah. I was super buzzed, super excited, but I never played. I played three out of the 14 <laughs> round robin games. And I only played the last three. Okay. When we had lost all the games, we had Maxwell and Miller. We had Johnson, Abbo, Sean Marsh, who's a Kings Eleven Punjab legend. Yeah. They love him. And that Marcus Stoinis. And like, I only played, I was like, a, I was a squad member. And we had lost, I think we, out of the 14 round robin games, we had won like three games. So the mood in the camp wasn't great. And, and, and like, I wasn't playing. I mean, the first month was amazing. Look, so exciting. Traveled to all these cool stadiums and we played in front of the crowds. And even though I was 12th man a lot of the time, it was still a great experience. Um, I think that first three months, three weeks in India was a lot. We lost the T20 World Cup against, uh, we just lost. We played poorly. And then to go to that, uh, there was a lot of losing, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, there was a lot of losing around, um, amongst the teams that I played. So that was tough. And um, yeah, the IPL was awesome um, for the first little bit. And then, you know, we lost a hell of a lot of games and mm. it just became a little bit of a, um, it, it became long. I was away from home for 10 weeks, you know, in yeah. India. It was, it, was, it was tough, but um, I still, I was fortunate enough to go to India and I, and, I, and I loved it and always thankful for that experience to play in IPL and I played three games. Um, but yeah, so I played at the uh, China Swami, I played against RCB and I played against Vasika Patnam against Pune and then I played again, I played at uh, Chandigarh. Um, at the Kings Eleven home ground, so those are the three games that I played. So it was yeah. it was challenging, but so, like a great experience. Yeah, you mentioned you were a, a squad member. I wondered before we're going into the IPL, were you expecting to get a contract, or was it a bit of a surprise? So I mentioned that in 2015 we beat India in India three two. Okay. We beat them in the T20 game two nil at series two nil. The third one got drained out, and then the early eyes we beat them. 3-2, it was 2 all going to the fifth at the Wankiri and I performed well. I got 30 or 15 balls in the one ODI. The T20, we chased 200 at Dharamshala, one of my favorite grounds in the world. I got 30 or 15 balls, not out to win the game with JP. JP got 70 of about 40 balls. Oh, wow. okay. And in that series, I kind of showed glimpses of, of like performing well in Indian conditions. And then the one game, I got also 30 of about 20 balls, not out in what, to close the innings out. And the coach at uh, Sanjay Bango was the coach of Kings Eleven Punjab. He was like helping out with India and he saw that I had some sort of talent. And he, yeah. so I did really well in those conditions. And that's when he gave me a contract. So um, it was a surprise. I was playing against Australia actually in the fourth ODI when we whitewashed them 5 0 in South Africa. And I walked off the field and they were like, Fadi, you got picked up for by Kings Eleven Punjab. So I didn't know what was going on. And it was literally the fourth ODI against Australia in South Africa at PE. And I was like, oh. Found out via Twitter and he got picked up okay. and I was like, yeah, that's that's how it was. I was busy playing that 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 day. So that 15, 16 was quite a busy time for me, traveling and playing. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. Um, are you okay for time? Yeah. A yeah. couple more couple more questions. I know it's a shame. No I, worries, I, I said it was going to no be 40 minutes. So. It's probably me. I'm I, I'm just talking a hell of a lot. So. No, I love it. Like, I'm like, <laughs> It's nothing worse than when a guy like says nothing. You're like, okay. <laughs> so I, no, I appreciate it. Thank no you. No worries, man. So I last week I read your um your tweet thread um that you posted yes. about CSA and the, I don't know what the mm. is surrounding it. Um, what do you think needs to change for the protests? You know, to be basically where we were when you were playing. 
Oh man. Or, or do we need um, a I think, <laughs> no, I, I look quickly. I think teams run in cycles, you know, people yeah. that uh, back, back in that time and I started 2012, mm. yeah, guys like Graham. I mean, I still played in ODR with Graham Smith, uh, Jacques Callas made my debut, like, mm. uh, but you just done his eyes. So like a young Faf, you had like um, Johan Puerta and like I played with the cricket with these guys that knew how to win games. Young Dale Stein, Young Mone Morkel, Faf to perceive. So like um, there was a cycle of, of, of winning. There was a cycle of our authority. We had some of the best players playing at the time. And um, yeah. I think the cycle just needs to, the, it's difficult. The cycle has kind of ended a little bit. We had lost so many players like Ashim, we lost AB, we lost Dale, we lost Mourne, we lost Vern. Like it's a big chunk of our team. We lost Abbott, Colpack, we lost a young Riley, a young uh, a Dane Villas, a Simon Armour. Yeah. Like it's 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 tough, man. Um so the cycle is 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 is, is kind of it needs to like change a little bit and, and, and I think we have to just wait with for the players to get enough experience win as a team at some point and then like those players will grow together and they will start to hopefully be um, a dominant team. I can't put my finger on it. I think it's just some of the guys are new to the environment. When I made my debut, there was a more senior guys playing than yeah. youngsters. Now there's like five or six newer guys that played less than five games each, you know, so they're still trying to find their way whether it's a youngster in the cricket game. So I related to rugby. Rugby, you can progress as a player very quickly. And cricket, it's so many variables in cricket. The pitch, the skill of the guy on the day, the weather conditions. The googly might drag a bit more today than what it has. So when it drags a bit more, instead of hitting the middle of your bat, it might have gotten a little bit, a couple of centimeters on the edge and you get caught along on another day, it goes for six. Yeah. yeah. You know, like the margins are so small in, in, in cricket and there's so many variables. That's why the to get up to consistency and to perform takes a while. There's only a few guys that can do it immediately. Guys like uh, Lungingiri was one of them. Kaki Sorobada was one of them. Quentin de Kock was one of them that took to international cricket quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. But there's not everybody takes... I mean, it took me six years to play franchise cricket before I even played for South Africa. It took Faf also six years to play before he played for South Africa. Some, the progression is different. You know, rugby players, they get up to a certain level, they get physically strong, they catch, they pass, they kick, they, 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 they tackle. Yeah. Your progression can be, can be uh, uh, sped up in that sort. There's not as many variables. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to take a bit of patience. It's going to take a time. Unfortunately, playing international sport is the, you're in the public eye. People want results. They think you need to be the finished article when you get to international cricket. Unfortunately, it's not that way. Yeah, yeah. You have to, there has to be patience and until we win a World Cup, the question will always be out, you know, one of the better teams percentage-wise win games mm. in white ball cricket, specifically 50 over cricket, but no, nothing to show for it. And uh, But yeah, the guys need more, a little bit more experience and, and, and not just from playing perspective from the maturity levels, I need to grow a little bit as a, as a, as a, as a group of guys and, and then Get lucky. I mean, I don't know. Get yeah. bounce of the ball. Get get lucky. <laughs> a drop catch or a run out that goes askew, or you know, a bowler that's off their game on the day. Or we get like Virat and Rohit and like whatever out in the first, like Pakistan Champions Trophy 2017. Mohammad Amir, he got Darwan, Rohit, and Virat out in his first five over spell, and India was blasted. Set, yeah, yeah. Set, and they won that. The Pakistan won a Champions Trophy in 2017. So like, you need something to put something like that to go your way. KG to blast somebody or putting to get a hundred of like eighty balls or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I must say, you know, in the last year, I've seen that me the media has been like seriously brutal on on the protests, like even more than yeah. um even more than like the, uh, the the spring box in 2017 or you know like I, i've just i don't know it's been something i've noticed yeah, like you'll you'll flick through twitter and it's like these articles and i'm like damn these guys, mm. these guys are getting it <laughs> i think it's twofold i think obviously csa's uh, troubles have been very well documented over the last two years and i think it doesn't it doesn't help in 
the the the, the leaders of your of your ship from a commercial point of view and an administration point of view is struggling you know so then your team struggles on top of that and we had a, we didn't have a great 2019 uh 50 of the world cup campaign um it was obviously it was evident i'm not just saying it because i think so it's evident because yeah, yeah it went great you know um yeah i think that all kind of play, plays a role whether you think it or not titans has been the best franchise and it's now come to an end but our Dr. Jacques Faure has been a great first. He leaves Lombard, who was our CEO, uh, she passed on. And then uh, Dr. Jacques Faure is like the best CEO in the country. Mm. And that, this, that they were so stable there, make us such a viable entity. And then like kept the board and the politics away from the players. And all we did was we went to the field, trained as hard as we could, went to the gym, tried to win games, tried to win trophies. And it was successful. We was, I mean... With the 18 trophies uh, from the Titans, the next best is nine from the Lions, you know, wow. more than double the trophies that yeah. any other franchise. And you think the Dolphins has been unbelievably successful. They've won like three trophies in their, <laughs> in their whole franchise history. Yeah. You've got you it. know what I mean? They just, yeah. so it's like they've won, like they got to a final, they've shared a few trophies, they won the four day, great. And they've played some, playing some really good cricket. And maybe it's a start of something for them. I, I mean, who knows? But. Yeah. People forget in that Titans era, like we won 18 trophies. Jeez. The Warriors have two trophies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or three. Yeah. The Knights also have like four. Like it's crazy. Yeah, that is. It's flipping insane. Mm. Yeah. So I think I, I think patience is needed. And I think once we sort out CSA a little bit from that side, that starts to stabilize because it does affect it whether you th- believe it or not. Like there's always something going on and that's the negativity around the media and the social media about our cricket team. Mm-hmm. It's also, you can see it, you can see it in CSA is the way they have, they've handled their business. It's always like, it's not just smooth sailing. Yeah. So now we try to win a World Cup and win games when like CSA, yeah, or, yeah they, 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 they troubled, so to say. Let's hope they can, <laughs> let's hope they can sort it out for the, you know, for all the cricketers. Yeah, I think I'll leave you with this question. Um, yes. Will, will we see another chase in the sun, but with the pro team? Um, yeah. From a completely un- unbiased standpoint. Oh, um... <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I don't think so. I think um, I think it will take a little bit longer. So what's next World Cup 2023? I reckon 2027, that gives us six years. 2023, mm, no, maybe 2027. Sure. See, 50 of a World Cup. There's T20 World Cups in between and stuff. That's good. That, that's cool. But 50 of a World Cup is the big one. Like, everybody wants to win that yes. World Cup. Okay. 2027. I reckon there's enough talent in our country to get to 2027. And for the guys to build up enough of a career. Okay. Aiden Markram would, 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 would be 32. Yarman Malan will be roughly in the same bracket. Uh, Lungingiri will be older. Um, Kesha, Bjorn Futain, those guys. Antile be further along the way, more experience, six years, win trophies, play a lot of games, get 50, 60, 70 more ODIs under your belt, you know, like that sort of thing. And then by that time, in six years' time, I reckon that'll be a great, so you must target, I reckon 2027 as a realistic goal for us to win a World Cup. England is far, they've surpassed their own, um, their own expectations. Um... I don't see chasing the sun story purely because leading into the World Cup. I mean, ask me the question after the West Indies and the Island trip. If we beat West Indies four one in the Caribbean, maybe. Maybe okay. If we beat Ireland, like because we need to win before the World Cup. It's not like South Africa won before the before the two thousand nine. They beat the All Blacks. They beat Australia. No. They drew. They won the castle. Uh, they won the championship. Uh, they beat Argentina in Argentina. And the boardroom be, be sorted. Yeah, like at that point, like Sia Colise, he was just, I mean, he was injured, but he, he, he was he was announced as captain. Like mm-hmm. Peter Steph, the toy, all these, we are started to play great rugby. The, 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 the shape of our team started to like look awesome. Like they picked a great squad. 
Mm. I'm very into that. I picked the right squad before the team was announced, and and and, and that is maybe something. Sometimes players don't know who's going to go on, on tour and who's going to go to the World Cups, but Rassi was very uh, instrumental and everybody knew who was going to go to that World Cup and their roles and their definitions and stuff like that. Like Chris Morris was, I think, our best player. He wasn't even selected to go to the 2019 World Cup. Yeah, He only went because Dale broke his shoulder again. So, and yeah. Morris played every game since he, when, he, when, he, when he got there. So, like, those sort of small little things, and I'm not blaming anybody. It's just like, it's very, you know, it's evident. It's like... Yeah. Um, but I don't think for now... Uh, that, I mean, that's me being pessimistic, but also a realist. I, yeah. I'm a massive optimist, but maybe not pessim- pessimism. I'm just being a realist. I don't think we have it just yet. But that's fine. I mean, there's always room to to blow my to blow my idea out of the out of the water, and it'll be a pleasant surprise. I mean, I always support the Proteas. Uh, I I just think the other teams have it pretty much waxed. Uh, Australia, West Indies, India. But let's wait and see against. Let's see if we can do something special in the in the West Indies and beat West Indies in their own backyard because they'll be a very strong side to beat. Mm. We're gonna go with a young team and let's let's see what we can do in their conditions. Yeah. If we beat them, it will give us confidence. Beat India in India before the World Cup. Maybe it could be a chase in the sun moment. But at, up until we don't, up until we uh, beat them, I'll I'll I'll, 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 I'll say no for now. Okay. But my my prediction is twenty twenty seven World Cup. Okay. Well, I'll send you a message if we smash um, uh, West Indies and <laughs> and India. an island in Ireland, yeah. An island in Ireland. Hopefully, I get to send that message. But wow, wow, wow! Thank you so much. I really appreciate Pleasure. your time, man. It's been so flipping cool chatting and getting your insights, you know, especially from such a well decorated pro tier like yourself. And next time, I'll get your 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 matches right and your your stats. <laughs> <laughs> No worries, bud. Thanks so much. Okay, Laka. Cheers. Have a good evening. Cheers, man. Bye.